It was a great reading, wasn't it, from the prophecy of Isaiah 53. And the prophecy, that particular prophecy there is obviously talking about the sufferings and the subsequent, subsequent glory of the servant or, or Christ, as it's quite obvious from that reading that, um, that we can see that. Um, and in relation tonight to our title, History Fulfills Bible Prophecy, there is so much evidence to show that the history of the world, as much as we have recorded, does fulfill and support Bible prophecy. And many, many critics of religion would attempt to discredit scripture and its prophecies as a Jewish or a Christian conspiracy, possibly. Um, or at best, they might say it's a good story and a good history book. But the Bible definitely does have a solid track record um, of fulfilled prophecy, and it actually parallels um, with external recorded history that we can see in the world around us. And it's supported by an ample archaeological evidence. So the basis of this address is obviously the Bible, which we've read from tonight. And for a few moments, firstly, I'd just like to review what and how exactly um, it came to be and, and why we should believe what it says in the first place. And I believe this to be paramount in, in, um, in regarding anything about the, about the Bible. So in regards to time, the Bible describes an absolute beginning only about 6,000 years ago. And, and we as Bible students expect to see no older existence of written history than that. And we expect the location of any artifacts that are dug up to be found in the ancient centre of the world um, in, in, in the Middle East there. And according to conventional archaeology that you'd, you'd learn at school, um, we are told that, that writing itself, the art of writing, wasn't actually invented until 3000 to 4000 BC in, in Sumeria or, or Mesopotamia there, that fertile crescent. And from biblical records, that's just after the time described as the worldwide flood, when God destroys all the wicked human life um, and Noah and his family are preserved and begin to repopulate the earth. Um, in that exact area of Mesopotamia, uh, the fertile crescent as it's called. So it's, it's not really a surprise then that the oldest discovered evidence of writing are limestone tablets um, found in, in Iraq, which is ancient Mesopotamia. And historians date these to around 3500 BC, and, and they say that they're the oldest form of, of coherent writing ever discovered. And another conventional understanding among historians is that the second big civilization, so the Mesopotamians uh, or the Sumerians were uh, the first, um, and it's common knowledge that the second oldest civilization um, to date is the, is, is the Egyptians, um, which historians say could be as old as about 3000 BC, um, possibly a little bit younger than that. And when we follow the biblical timeline, the next civilization we come to in Genesis is, of course, the Egyptians. And it's no surprise, um, and straight away we can sort of see, even just from a basic look like that, that the Bible record does actually parallel um, with common ancient history, like it's taught in, in school. Now, right back to the very earliest physical evidence that, that man can find in the world today. So in, in general, um, the fact that the Bible follows that time um, record is not really disputed uh, among historians. Um, and the Bible itself, as we have it here, has, has quite the history in itself. 2,500 years from, from the beginning of time described in the Bible, God inspires a man called Moses to physically record the first five books of the Bible. And over the next 1,500 years, God inspires 40 different men among three different continents and many different languages to continue cataloging and compiling the history of, of his people and what happened to them. Until um, in, in the early century, as we call it AD, 2,000 years ago, uh, they were recorded, passed down, um, copied, and very much protected um, for 1,500 years. So straight off, it's, it was such an immense task, I believe, for one nation, a small nation like Israel, um, amongst a very hostile world to preserve such a large collection of books completely. 
and, and by this stage in time, in AD, um, much more general history um, is being recorded. And, and we today have many facts about the past 2,000 years. Um, so much of, much of it can be confirmed and substantiated. Um, the early centuries uh, in, in the common era um, are known as the Christian era. And not, su not surprisingly following on from the massive impact that Jesus Christ had on the world. Um, Christianity was under persecution in those early centuries, uh, especially by the ruling power um, Rome at the time. Um, one of the early emperors ordered at, at one stage all the Christian books destroyed, all the copies of the Bible that they could find, destroy them, get rid of them. Um, this eff effort was obviously not totally successful. Um, but, but soon after, Rome actually legalised um, Christianity. And by the year 400, the copies of the Bible had been compiled into, into one book, a Greek book known as the Septuagint. And it was then translated um, into Latin um, by a man called Jerome. Over, over 23 years it took him to do that. And that, that version was called the Vulgate. Or Vulgate. Um, and that, that version is the version that the Catholic Church and other Christians, I guess, in, in Europe used throughout the period um, of the Dark Ages, which is the next 1,000 years. And, and we understand that period to be a time where public learning about the Bible and about God was very much discouraged um, and held, held pretty tight by the Catholic Church in, in that Latin format. Um, but in the early 1300s, um, in the time of the Revolution, um, there's a renewed interest in theology. And because the Bible was only written in Latin, um, there was a, a big push to get it translated into English, and we owe that to, to a few different men. Um, one of the big ones in the 1500s, obviously, um, William Tyndale, um, eventually he, he translated a complete copy of the Bible um, from, from very old manuscripts, um, surviving manuscripts, which were in fact from um, only about 1,000 years after... Um, 1,000 years. So the the manuscripts that he translated the Bible from were already 1,000 years old um, from the time of the of, of the of the New Testament when it said it was written. Um, and he was actually burned at the stake for doing that. So he he paid a pretty high price for getting that Bible translated. Um, and and later on, the Bible was divided into chapters and verses. Um, and in 1600s, the, the King James Version was, was mass-produced. So, and, and from that time, scholars have continued to translate the Bible um, into different languages and versions to try and make it easier for, for people to read as well. And the, the reason I ran through that, um, and it's quite a colourful history, um, is we can see that the Bible has been passed down through ancient Jewish scholars. It's been protected from destruction from other civilizations. Translated from Greek to Hebrew to Latin to English, it survived the Dark Ages. Um, it was it was further translated and revised. And the the point I came to when I was when I was looking at all that history is, it seemed like it was pretty safe to say that um, there would be a reasonable degree of variance between the copy of the Bible that we have now, and say a very early manuscript, a, a BC manuscript of say Isaiah, for instance. So. If, if we had a 2,500-year-old copy of Isaiah, could we safely say, given all that happening through time, that our current version would be a fair bit different? Well, it's probably, probably quite possible, I would have thought. Um, but up until 70 years ago, and this adds to it, th the world's oldest copies of biblical text that we could go off um, were only 1,000 years old. So already, it's nothing close to what you would call an original copy um, you know, something that you'd call something from around the New Testament era would, be, would have to be 2,000 years old. So considering that, you know, you'd surely think that it's a little bit jumbled up, a little bit uneven. Um, I've, I've probably used this photo before. Some of you would have seen this before. This is an infographic on Bible Echoes, and it was compiled by a, a Christian pastor um, through, who throughout his life he'd noted down lots of cross-references in his, in his Bible, um, and also a lot of the cross-references that are already in the King James Version. And he wanted to get a guy to put it into a graph for him to see how it, um, how it was displayed. And they came up with this beautiful arc diagram. Um, and so, so what can we tell 
or what should this graph be able to tell us about how we can engage, engage with the Bible in, in the modern age so far from its originality? Well, the cross-references in the Bible tell us that it is a, more so a beautifully rendered tapestry rather than a, a chaotic um, patchwork quilt. It's, it's very evenly unified and consider, considering the fact that we've looked at all those different, um, all those different things that happen to the, the biblical text throughout time, um, in the face of such diversity, the Bible still um, holds unity and, it fl and the, fl the flow through the Bible is very consistent. Um, the, the touch points for all the references that talks to each other are very symmetrical um, and, and balanced. And we believe as Bible students that God was obviously superintending the process to keep, keep the Bible um, in its origin, original state. And if the Bible's development had been completely random, like some critics would say, um, chaotic, with no purpose um, you know, in terms of going somewhere and actually meaning something real, I don't think after all that time that we would see um, an image like that. And, and ultimately for me, and for a lot of people here as well, when you study the book and see it come alive um, on so many levels of understanding, and you never see it fully exhausted, that is what really proves to me that the text itself and the prophecies in it are inspired by God. And eventually I suppose um, th those sort of things overtake the historically visual facts that um, that other people would go off to prove the Bible. So the fact that um, the chronological progression of the Bible matches that of our own history for the past 5,000 years, and it makes sense while doing it still, so much um, long, uh, later, um, it should be enough proof to us that it was written when it was written. And historians will conclusively work backwards through time and they'll say, yes, the Romans were, were around, yes, the Greeks, the Persians, the Babylonians, Egyptians, they get to the Sumerians, the Mesopotamians, and they start to you know, lose, um, lose real physical things that they can prove. But right back through then, um, you know, they, they follow the same, the same historical record as, as the Bible. And, and all the while through, as the Bible's matching that, um, it, it, it retains this unique connective message. Um, <coughs> So, despite even that, um, is there grounds, do you think, to say that the prophecies, like we read in Isaiah 53 there, um, that clearly reference Jesus or a Messiah, and there's many more prophecies you can look at, do you think, despite, despite everything we've looked at, that there, a critic could say, well, how do you know that the, um, that the Catholics or the Christians in the Dark Ages didn't, didn't add all these prophecies in to validate the Bible? Um, how do you... How could we possibly prove that it is actually, you know, two and a half thousand years old? Well, well, one thing that proved that, and it was only in the last 70 years that these were found, is the Dead Sea Scrolls. So up until, up until 70 years ago, the oldest physical manuscript of any biblical text was only a thousand years old. Um, but then these were discovered. They were discovered in 1947 in 11 caves along the northwest shore of the Dead Sea. And this is a very arid region, east of Jerusalem and 400 metres below sea level. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are comprised of the remains of approximately 900 separate scrolls preserved in, in jars, in clay jars. And they're represented by tens of thousands of, of other fragments as well. And the texts are most commonly made on, on leather, but also papyrus. And there's one in there that's made on, on, a, on a sheet of copper. Um, but why, why are they important? Well, fragments of every single book of the Old Testament were discovered in, in the Dead Sea Scroll caves, except for the book of Esther. And identified among the scrolls are 19 copies of Isaiah, 25 copies of Deuteronomy, and 30 copies of the Psalms. And a virtually intact um, Isaiah scroll, which contains some of the most dramatic messianic prophecies, like, like the one we read tonight in Isaiah 53. Um, and these are all 1,000 years older than any previously found copy of the Bible in the world. Um, and this library of scrolls appears to be hidden away um, in caves just before the outbreak of the, the Jewish revolt in AD 66, so just before the Roman army 
advances against the Jews and destroys everything they own. Um, some, some Jewish scholars run to these caves and they hide every copy that they've, that they've got. And based on various dating methods, the Dead Sea Scrolls would have to be written between the period of 200 or 300 BC to 70 AD. And many of the crucial Bible manuscripts that um, contain the prophecies about the Messiah, about Christ, date to at least 100 BC. So that's 100 years at a minimum before Christ actually came. And because of that, because of that fact, the Dead Sea Scrolls have revolutionised the textual, textual uh, criticism of the Old Testament. So we find these biblical texts in substantial agreement with the translations of the Old Testament that we have used today. And often they're very much word for word. So you can, you can do a simple Google search on, a, on the Dead Sea Scroll of Isaiah 53. Um, you'll see it there with the translation. And it's almost word for word exactly what we have in our, in our Bibles today. Um, so they've, they've definitely provided phenomenal evidence for the credibility of Bible scripture. And specifically, that greater Isaiah scroll, um, you know, it's almost identical to the most recent manuscript that we have that was 1,000 years older. So, <clears throat> and, and yeah, remembering that the, the scrolls found in there were dated to as old as 300 years before Christ actually was on the earth. So that they sit in this untouched um, environment for approximately 2,000 years. If they were hidden away in AD 70 uh, and weren't found till 1947, that's nearly two millennia. They sat in these caves untouched, nobody destroyed them, no weather events got to them or fire or anything. Um, and I think it's remarkable that in 1947, this Bedouin shepherd was throwing rocks into the cave just for fun, and he smashes a clay jar and subsequently stumbles upon these Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and one year later, after 2,000 years of, of history, of, of dispersion of the Jews, the Jews return to their homeland um, as a formal nation. So I don't take that as coincidence. Um, I think in, the, in itself, just that fact that they were found at that time um, is remarkable. And so for me, it's encouraging to read um, these prior messianic prophecies with absolute assurance um, that, they are, that they were written when they were written. And this means that, that 300 other Old Testament prophecies that we could go to of the coming Messiah did indeed pre-exist the birth of Christ. And so ultimately, I suppose, it's up to each of us to decide what to do um, when, when we realise that as a reality. Now, the survival of the biblical text itself um, in its accuracy is amazing but above this it's also evident that the survival of the nation of Israel is also a major witness to the reality of Bible prophecy which we'll, we'll come to in a sec. Um, thousands of years ago Moses, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Daniel and other Old Testament prophets they foretold the destiny of the Jewish people and as we see in external history confirms that everything happened just as it said it would in, that, in their order. And some of the prophetic information that we have recorded <clears throat> throughout the Bible um, is scarily accurate, if I can use that word. It's a very accurate record of history, um, the history of the world. And parts of Daniel, for instance, are extremely precise, um, down to very fine detail. And this is a very, a very common um, depiction of Daniel 2, um, where Daniel explains the future empires to come, um, symbolised by Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Um, and you could spend a whole night on this chapter itself, um, but basi basically um, Nebuchadnezzar has a, a dream, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He can't decipher it, neither can any of his wise men, but Daniel's there, um, a Jew in exile from Jerusalem, and, and he goes through and, and explains it to Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, look, you're this head of gold, you're Babylon. But another kingdom inferior to you will arise. And so it did. Persia came and, and overtook Babylon. Daniel goes on to say that yet a third kingdom will come, a bronze kingdom, and, which is represented by Greece. And then there should be a fourth kingdom that is strong as iron, represented by the Roman power that came. And the Romans... Um, 
if you look at their, their empire, was far larger than any of the, the previous ones, and they held, held a lot of strength with that. And then also the, the prophecy goes on to describe a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness shall be in it, which, which we take to, to be the, the Roman Catholic Church, which is really only the, the one surviving thing from the Roman Empire after it fell apart. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church is, is still around today. And at, towards the end of the prophecy, it describes a stone that was cut from a mountain by no human hand, um, which we put down to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a future fulfilment yet to happen, um, to come and to break in pieces all these kingdoms, and it hits it right on the feet at the one surviving thing of, of this image of, of man. So it's, it's a very common depiction. It's widely confirmed to be accurate prophecy of the future um, that came after the time of Babylon. Um, not just Christadelphians say that, many Christians um, as well, and it's, it's definitely pretty, pretty common. <clears throat> um, another one is, is Daniel 11. Uh, I don't expect you to read that, but on, on purpose I've put it there <laughs> because um, word for word in Daniel 11, um, through God's inspiration, Daniel describes in very fine detail uh, the future history of the Greek Empire. And verse by verse, you can go through and read the verse and read what happened in history. And it's, it's pretty amazing to see, if, if you've never looked at it before, to, to go through and see how, how history played out um, as Daniel said it would in symbol. But basically, to give you a brief rundown of that one, Daniel gives you a brief pred prediction of the setting up of the Grecian monarchy upon the ruins of the Persian monarchy, which was now newly begun. A prediction of the affairs of the two kingdoms of Egypt and Syria, north and south, um, and they reference each other. Also, the rise of, of a powerful man, Antiochus Epiphanes, and his actions and successes. It talks about the Maccabean Revolt, the emergence of a Roman power, and also a future, which we believe is yet to come, a future invasion of Israel in, in modern times. So verse by verse, you can go through and follow the biblical prophecy as it symmetrically matches real events in sequence as recorded by other historians um, as well. And, and, and these events are often um, supported if you went to, if you did history at school um, or, or university or something. They might not use the Bibles to substantiate it, but they'd use other things and they'd say exactly the same story um, that, that Daniel explains. So again, a very commonly reviewed prophecy, not just among Christadelphians, but the rest of the world as well. And you could spend a whole night on Daniel 2 and Daniel 11. Um, but yeah, if, if you're interested, I can direct you to hour-long talks on each of them um, with much more information to, to prove that as well. So we, we've seen the history of the Bible itself. Um, and despite everything that could have gone wrong, it has survived. And not only has it survived in its entirety as a whole book, but its accuracy has survived as well and been proven to be the same for well over 2,000 years. We saw in that infographic that its, its symmetry and direction is consistent right the way through, um, and also the outside information on our recorded history matches the chronological sequence um, and the major prophecies of, of the Bible. And so for a book that's so small and so accessible today um, in many different languages and translations, it's something that's certainly taken for granted by the majority. And this is very understandable as man is always going to do what pleases him um, and the Bible does place demands on us. And one theme I want to focus on to round out our thoughts tonight is the enduring survival and permanency of God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. Because the perseverance of Jewish existence proves that they are a living witness to Bible reality. And their history and future was written far in advance and there's still, um, there's still prophecies to be fulfilled about them. So when talking about God's chosen people, I suppose we can ask the question of why does God need a chosen people to outwork his plan and purpose? Why did God set apart a nation um, that, was, that was chosen? And from a, from a Gentile or a non-Jewish <laughs> perspective, <clears throat> um, how, like, w when we look at when we think about the Jews as a, as a chosen people, are they are they somehow superior to us or receive special treatment 
or are more loved by God than us. And the Jewish concept of a chosen people, um, as we see from the Bible, is not so much a badge of superiority um, and separation as it is a humble call to action and responsibility and to be an example to other nations. So very quickly then, what makes a Jew? Well, its origins begin, begin with the word Hebrew, um, coming from the proper name Eber, listed in Genesis 10 as the great-grandson of Shem. And the original root word can be traced back to a phrase from the other side. So in that case, Hebrew would be a word designating an immigrant, which Abraham, a descendant of Eber, uh, certainly was. And Abraham's grandson Jacob's name was changed to Israel in Genesis 35. We read that. So Jacob and his descendants would be called the first Israelites. And Jacob's fourth son, Judah, and his descendants were called Judahites or Judeans. And later the name Judean was shortened to Jew. So technically, Jews are Israelite Hebrews from the region of Judea. And they come from Abraham, who was a Hebrew, and then through Jacob, who was an Israelite, and through Judah, who was a Jew. So in common usage, all these names are words referring to God's chosen people and ultimately their descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God's intention to identify with this particular nation of people was to the end that they might be an example to the rest of the world. <clears throat> so in Exodus 19, um, we read there that it says, You shall be my treasured possession among all people. Now, the King James says a peculiar nation. So this was the nation's initial calling to be separate from the rest of the world as they came out uh, from bondage in Egypt. And if you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28, just with me. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Um, this, this chapter presents a reward to the Jewish nation um, should they faithfully obey. So Deuteronomy 28 verse 1 reads, And it shall come to pass, if you will hearken diligently unto the voice of Yahweh thy God, to observe and do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that Yahweh thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. So if they faithfully, faithfully obey, they would be set on high and, and preserved. That was a reward to them. But if you look in verse 15, um, there, there's a warning there, and it says, But it shall come to pass, if you will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and statutes, then all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And there's 54 preceding verses there that talk about um, all the curses that might come upon Israel should they disobey um, God's word, which we know obviously they did, and they actually did all come to pass upon Israel. So if you come over to verse 36, we read in verse 36, Yahweh shall bring thee and thy king, which thou shalt set up over thee, unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And there thou shalt serve other gods wood and stone, and shall become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, whither the Lord shall lead thee. So this is talking about the nation being exiled to Babylon. And there did come a, a king um, that, that took them away, and Israel did become an astonishment and a, and a proverb, a byword to other nations around them. And if you come down to verse 48, we read there, it goes on to say, Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which, which Yahweh shall send against thee, in hunger and in thirst, in nakedness, and in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon your neck until he have destroyed thee. And Yahweh shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as an eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue you, sh you will not understand. <clears throat> okay, so this yoke of iron represents the Roman takeover, and we, we have a link there to Daniel 2 and, and Daniel's image, where the, the legs of iron matched up with history and, and represented the, the Romans that did indeed come and take them. Um, we can read of all the atrocities in AD 70 that, that happened to the Jewish nation. So these things have come to pass. This is confirmed as being, ha has, have happened already. 
um, 2,000 years ago. So, so right throughout time, the Jews have been persecuted. And they are a tiny country. They're, they're only one eight hundredth of the total Middle East as far as land mass goes. And they happen to be right in the middle, um, located on a, a plot of arid, resourceless land. And yet, this seems to be one Jewish state too many for, for the rest of the world for much of time. Israel is condemned for daring to survive. And they're the only country in the world whose existence is has been constantly challenged and is challenged today. So in Deuteronomy 28, <clears throat> we, we read a few verses in there and it, we, we can see described that the Jews would be scattered all over the world, hated, persecuted and driven from country to country. So we know we've got heaps of proof that they were exiled to Babylon, they came back to their land, then the Romans came and, and destroyed them again and that time they were dispersed for over two millennia. So that one, we can say, has been confirmed. <clears throat> we then can read an, a further prophecy in Leviticus that describes that meanwhile, while they're in exile, their land, once so fruitful, would lie desolate. Um, and in more recent times, during the, the Jews' exile, um, after AD 70, a man called uh, Mark Twain, you've probably heard of, um, he visited the land of Israel in 1869 and he wrote this brief description of the land. He says, of all the lands there are for dismal scenery, I think Palestine must be the prince. The hills are barren, they are full of, they are dull of colour, they are unpicturesque in shape, the valleys are unsightly deserts, fringed with feeble vegetation that has an expression about it of being sorrowful and despondent. So there's nothing really there that took his fancy, it wasn't really a land flowing with milk and honey. Um, and so, so we can see, like just from Leviticus 28, saying that that would happen, that even in our recent history, um, that will have been confirmed. In, in Jeremiah 30 and Hosea 3, um, we read that despite everything that happened to the Jews, they would survive all of these troubles and actually outlive their persecutors. So, like we've seen in our previous slides, Babylon. Um, persecuted them, Babylon's been and gone. Persia came and persecuted them, they've been and gone. The Greeks and even the mighty Roman Empire was you know, a lot bigger than the Israelites. They've all come and gone and somehow the Jews, they've survived. Um, and even after AD 70, when they lost their national land, they had no national territory, um, they were dispersed for 1800 years throughout the world with, with actually no, no country of their own. And then despite that, they were still pursued. In World War II, we read of the Nazi annihilation, the annihilation attempt anyway. Um, and while it was horrific, it actually paved the way for their return to Israel. And they are the only people on earth ever to retain their national identity without having a national territory. And I, I did take that from, um, I think something Morris once said. But yeah, I'll repeat that. So the people on, they're the only people on earth ever, ever to retain their national identity without having a national territory. And for so long it's quite remarkable that they, that they actually got that back. And they even, even their original language um, has been preserved. So it's quite, quite remarkable and we can say that that's definitely been confirmed. Ezekiel 11 and, and 36, they also go on to say further prophecies, and these are just a few, there's, there's many more, that eventually, while still disobeying God, the Jews would, would go back to their own land. And they definitely have, there's lots of history, recent, very recent history to, to support that. Um, even in some of our lifetimes here, we would have seen that happen. Um, and there's, there's dates there and... and um, and things that happened that, that progressed towards the, the state of Israel actually being declared. And again, I'll mention that I think it's very significant that those Dead Sea Scrolls were found one year before you know, the Jews actually got their nation back. Amidst everything that was happening, um, you know, all the persecution that they faced, I think that's definitely a remarkable thing that was found one year before they got their homeland back. And even after... 
um, Israel got their land back, the Arab countries around them um, attacked them straight away. And so the, the Jews fought three more disastrous wars against, against the Arabs um, and against overwhelming odds, and we can read this history as well, it's very much available online, definitely overwhelming odds, they were victorious every time. Um, so yes, we can definitely say that all of that has been confirmed as well. So there's just a few things tonight, um, and there's, there's lots more that we can go into, but to me, that they prove um, that the history, the history has indeed fulfilled Bible, Bible prophecy. The impossible became reality time and time again. And very unlikely events that seemed coincidence at the time, actually in hindsight we, we can see that they furthered the purpose for Israel over and over again. And the miraculous survival of, of the Jews and the Bible itself um, proves God's hand in, in history. And, and we hold history in hindsight now, don't we, with, with the Bible that we have and the history that we can look back on. And therefore, I think we really do have an incentive to learn something from it. And if God has said things before that have happened, um, miraculous things, why won't the rest, all the future prophecies that the Bible contains, who's to say that they're not going to happen as well, and impossible as they may seem? So the Bible's not, it's not a boring book. It does come alive as the real truth is discovered. And, and the beautiful thing is that it's not just the Jews, God's chosen people, that get to um, you know, rejoice at, at the end when, when Jesus returns to the earth. We can also share in God's reward um, to the faithful. So to, to truly believe this message tonight, that history prof, um, proves Bible prophecy, it does take time, your own time and your own reading, and yes, God's word will put demands on all of us. And its message goes against our selfish nature and our desires. But there is a greater time to come, and it's promised to all who believe and live its message. And we can escape our otherwise wicked nature and mortality through God's grace and experience his character and creative power for eternity. So in conclusion then, let's, let's prepare for our future by learning from our history. Thank you.